Before we begin, be warned this video will include spoilers. This video is the fourth in a series of franchise reviews covering the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If you haven't yet watched the previous three, in which I reviewed the films of Phase 1 as well as the first half of Phase 2, I suggest you do so before watching this video. The studio's next release was, quite literally, out of this world, as Marvel began to embrace the cosmic side of their cinematic universe with Guardians of the Galaxy. This film was another risk for Marvel. Though the Guardians of the Galaxy had existed in Marvel Comics since 1969, the team was less widely known than the core members of the Avengers. Director James Gunn likened this film to the first Iron Man, both being the start of something new. The film primarily took inspiration from the comic's 2008 relaunch. Unlike previous origin films, Guardians of the Galaxy features an ensemble cast. In that respect, the film was more akin to the Avengers than Iron Man. Chris Pratt plays the team's leader, Peter Quill. Or as he wants to be known... Star-Lord. Who? Well, Star-Lord, man. Legendary outlaw. Pratt had previously lost weight for roles in Moneyball and Zero Dark Thirty. However, he had gained weight again for Delivery Man. For Guardians of the Galaxy, he underwent a strict diet and training regime to lose 60 pounds, or 27 kilograms, in six months. At the time, Pratt was best known for his role as Andy Dwyer in the NBC sitcom Parks and Recreation. So the only thing you did was stop drinking beer? Yeah, I lost 50 pounds in one month. How much beer were you drinking? <laughs> I know, right? Probably too much. He reportedly improvised a number of comedic moments throughout the film. The film flirts with a potential romance between Peter and Gamora, played by Zoe Saldana, but never fully commits. The hell? I know who you are, Peter Quill, and I am not some starry-eyed wait here to succumb to your, your pelvic sorcery. Saldana seems to enjoy playing different colored aliens. I've been blue once, so I thought, why not try green? <laughs> of all the Guardians, Gamora is the one who most wants to do the right thing. As such, she serves as the team's moral compass. To portray the Kylosian warrior Drax the Destroyer, Marvel cast WWE wrestler Dave Bautista. Despite limited acting experience, Batista gave an emotionally grounded performance while also providing comic relief. His people are completely literal. Metaphors are gonna go over his head. Nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too fast. I would catch it. In Marvel Comics, Drax is green. However, this was changed for the film primarily to distinguish him from the Hulk. Batista's makeup initially took about four and a half hours to apply each day, with the actor standing up the entire time. One of the film's biggest challenges was the fact that two of the five main characters were entirely CG. Groot, voiced by Vin Diesel, only ever repeats the same three words. I am Groot. Well, that's just as fascinating as the first 89 times you told me that. While it may seem odd to cast a known actor to deliver three words of dialogue, Diesel took the role seriously. His performance breathed life into Groot. I am Groot! Diesel also recorded Groot's lines for several foreign language releases of the film. Groot is the most physically imposing of the Guardians, while also being the most innocent. His sacrifice at the end of the film is an emotional moment. We are Groot. Of course, it did give the world baby Groot, who is just adorable. Behind his abrasive demeanor, Rocket, voiced by Bradley Cooper, is quite a tragic character. Why well, didn't ask to get made? 
I didn't ask to be torn apart and put back together over and over and turned into some, some little monster. His connection with Groot shows that he does care about others despite appearances. James Gunn's brother, Sean Gunn, portrayed Rocket on set. He also played the Ravager, Kraglin. The filmmakers drew a lot of inspiration from a real raccoon named Oreo. James Gunn was especially fond of the animal. Despite several valiant attempts to make the film's villain, Ronan the Accuser, an imposing force, the Kree Radical is ultimately little more than a generic bad guy. Lee Pace really tries. Unfortunately, there just isn't that much to the character. Interestingly, Ronan is the one who gives the team their name. Behold! Your Guardians of the Galaxy! I was excited when it was announced that former Doctor Who star Karen Gillan had been cast as Nebula. The redhead famously shaved her head in preparation for the role. And I might have done something a little bit crazy. <laughs> Michael Rooker gives a memorable performance as Yondu. In Marvel Comics, Yondu was a founding member of the original Guardians. Both of these characters would receive more development in the sequel. The film has an impressive supporting cast, including Jaiman Honsu, John C. Riley, and Glenn Close. It also features the first appearance of Josh Brolin as Thanos. Guardians of the Galaxy is quite a unique entry in the MCU. When I saw the first trailer back in 2014, I didn't know what to make of it. On the surface, the film is a wacky space adventure. However, it also has a strong emotional core. I look around at us, you know what I see? Losers. I mean, like, folks who have lost stuff. And we have, man, we have, all of us. Our homes, our families, normal lives. Each of its characters are damaged in their own way, but manage to form a kind of family together. The film in many ways owes its distinctive tone to co-writer and director James Gunn. In my review of Iron Man, I described Jon Favreau as the first of several indispensable Marvel directors. However, I haven't mentioned any others since. To rectify this, I've decided to add a recurring segment to these reviews, acknowledging indispensable Marvel directors. To clarify, these are directors whose unique visions have helped shape the MCU. Alongside Favreau, I am retroactively including Joss Whedon and Anthony and Joe Russo, and am of course adding James Gunn. Guardians of the Galaxy lives up to its title, visiting various galactic locations throughout. However, despite this, the plot never becomes confusing or hard to follow. The filmmakers drew inspiration from a number of real world influences. For example, Peter's ship, the Milano, was based on a hot rod. Gunn confirmed via Twitter that Peter named the ship after his childhood crush, Alyssa Milano. Music played a more significant role in Guardians of the Galaxy than any previous MCU film. Peter's mixtape cassette, Awesome Mix Volume 1, is one of the most iconic elements of the film. The songs were deliberately included as a way to keep both the character and the viewer connected to Earth. The tape is also heavily tied to Peter's emotional arc, having been given to him by his late mother. My mom liked sharing with me all the pop songs that she loved growing up. I happened to have it on me when I was... The day that she... You know, when I left Earth. Gunn chose the songs himself from a playlist of era-appropriate songs that he thought would fit the film's tone. The opening scene was originally written with Blue Suede's cover of Hooked on a Feeling in mind. However, once Gunn heard Come and Get Your Love by Redbone, he felt that song worked better. In the end, Moon Age Daydream by David Bowie was the only song added to the film in post-production. This soundtrack was released as Guardians of the Galaxy Awesome Mix Volume 1. The album became the first soundtrack to ever top the US Billboard 200 chart without any original music. Hollywood Records also released the soundtrack as a limited edition cassette tape. The soundtrack's immense popularity often overshadows Tyler Bates' score, which is a real shame because his music is also a significant part of the film. The Guardian's theme is particularly memorable.
Unlike most productions, Bates composed the score before filming began, so that the music could be played on set. The Collector's Museum is a treasure trove of easter eggs, including a Chitari from The Avengers and a Dark Elf from Thor The Dark World. It also contains references to Marvel Comics, such as Cosmo. The film's post credits scene features a surprise appearance by Howard the Duck, voiced by Seth Green. Believe it or not, Howard the Duck, released in 1986, was actually the first feature film based on a Marvel character. Guardians of the Galaxy revealed more about the mysterious Infinity Stones. Before creation itself, there were six singularities. Then the universe exploded into existence and the remnants of these systems were forged into concentrated ingots. The inclusion of the Power Stone, as well as visual references to the Space Stone and the Reality Stone, helped to connect the Guardians to the wider MCU. At the time, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was strictly Earthbound. Nevertheless, the series still managed to tie into the film by introducing the Kree. You told me last year the Kree had not visited our realm. If a Kree came to your world unannounced now, I would assume he's up to no good. Guardians of the Galaxy is a wild ride. Everyone involved managed to deliver a truly unique experience, bringing something exciting and new to the MCU. After that cosmic foray, the MCU returned to Earth for the highly anticipated sequel, Avengers Age of Ultron. As I mentioned in my review, The Avengers is one of my top five favourite films. As such, I was incredibly excited for the sequel. The film takes its title from the Marvel Comics event Age of Ultron, though the plot is not an adaptation of that storyline. In contrast to the first film, The Avengers are assembled from the very first scene. They are far more unified, even as the events of this film threaten to tear them apart. The team feels well established, organically playing off each other's strengths, particularly Thor and Captain America. It's like they're lining up. Well, they're excited. Seriously, rewatch the film and pay close attention to their double act. The character interactions are more casual, making them feel like old friends. Wait a second, no one else is going to deal with the fact that Cap just said language? I know. <laughs> just slipped out. The iconic party scene, where the heroes each take turns trying to lift Mjolnir, really highlights the various character relationships. Returning director Joss Whedon once again successfully juggled the ever-growing cast, allowing each character the opportunity to shine without overshadowing one another. Tony Stark and Steve Rogers still butt heads occasionally. Every time someone tries to win a war before it starts, innocent people die. Every time. However, it's clear the two have formed a genuine friendship. The Battle of New York affected Tony more than any other Avenger, causing the self-proclaimed genius billionaire playboy philanthropist to become obsessed with preemptively averting the next threat. I see a suit of armor around the world. Sounds like a cold world, Tony. Ironically, his obsession with protecting the world is ultimately what puts it in danger, as Tony is largely responsible for the creation of the film's titular villain. Ultron can't tell the difference between saving the world and destroying it. Where do you think he gets that? Excluding Mark Ruffalo's cameo in Iron Man 3, neither Bruce Banner or Clint Barton had appeared on screen since The Avengers. Poor Hawkeye was still the butt of jokes both on and off screen. Pretending to need this guy really brings the team together. Thankfully, Clint was given a more significant role in Age of Ultron. I've done the whole mind control thing. Not a fan. The film gives him some much needed character development, allowing Jeremy Renner to flesh out the character. Bruce also received more development than he had in the first film. Age of Ultron introduced a controversial romance between Bruce and fellow Avenger Natasha Romanoff. Personally, I thought this was a very natural development for both characters. Mark Ruffalo and Scarlett Johansson play off each other well. This film finally gave viewers a glimpse of Black Widow's past. The Red Room had also appeared on the small screen in Agent Carter. After the events of Captain America The Winter Soldier, the inclusion of Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury felt more obligatory than strictly necessary. Here we all are, back on Earth, with nothing but our wit and our will to save the world. 
Age of Ultron includes brief appearances by several supporting characters from previous films, such as Anthony Mackie as Sam Wilson, as well as cameos by Hayley Atwell as Peggy Carter and Idris Elba as Heimdall. Don Cheadle's War Machine even takes part in the Avengers' final confrontation with Ultron in Sokovia. You think I can't hold my own? We get through this, I'll hold your own. You had to make it weird. Of course, this film also introduced several new characters to the MCU. Twins Pietro and Wanda Maximoff managed to shake up the Avengers dynamic in a good way. It was a little weird seeing Aaron Taylor Johnson and Elizabeth Olsen play siblings, after playing a married couple in Godzilla the previous year. The whole thing brings to mind the Ultimates from Marvel Comics. Something both actors seem to indirectly acknowledge in interviews. I love the relationship that develops between Clint and the Maximoffs. As the most normal Avenger, Clint helps the newcomers adjust to this crazy world. Wanda in particular brings out his paternal side. Doesn't matter what you did, what you were. If you go out there, you fight, and you fight to kill. Stay in here, you're good. I'll send your brother to come find you, but if you step out that door, you are an Avenger. The back and forth between Clint and Pietro allowed Renner to show his funny side. Keep up, old man. Nobody would know. Nobody. Another version of Quicksilver, played by Evan Peters, had appeared in X-Men Days of Future Past the previous year. However, both films use the character very differently. Paul Bettany had voiced Stark's AI, Jarvis, since the first Iron Man. Jarvis, you up? For you, sir, always. In Age of Ultron, Bettany took on the physical role of the Vision. Why does your Vision sound like Jarvis? We reconfigured Jarvis's matrix to create something new. Ultron is chillingly brought to life by James Spader's performance. Despite playing a CG character, Spader is a commanding presence throughout, managing to be both funny and scary at the same time. Everyone creates the thing they dread. Men of peace create engines of war. Invaders create Avengers. People create... smaller people? Uh, children! I <laughs> lost the word there. While the idea of an artificial consciousness with no one physical form initially seems impossibly overwhelming, Ultron's motivations are ultimately fairly generic. You said we would destroy the Avengers, make a better world. It will be better. When everyone is dead. That is not... The human race will have every opportunity to improve. And if they don't? Ask Noah. His ultimate defeat definitely left the door open for a possible return. In Marvel Comics, Ultron was created by Dr. Hank Pym, aka Ant-Man. An older Hank Pym, played by Michael Douglas, would make his MCU debut in Marvel Studios' next release. It is interesting that both characters made their first big screen appearances in the same year, in separate films. Age of Ultron retroactively revealed that Loki's scepter from the first film contained the Mind Stone. This certainly felt like a decision made after the fact, and arguably raised more questions than it answered. The Maximoffs and Vision all received their powers from the stone, granting them more fantastical abilities than previous characters. Their abilities? He's got increased metabolism and improved thermal homeostasis. Her thing is neuroelectric interfacing, telekinesis, mental manipulation. He's fast and she's weird. Wanda's powers actually seem more akin to the reality stone. The death of an Avenger was rumored long before the film's release. Whedon is well known for killing off beloved characters, such as Phil Coulson in The Avengers. As the least developed member of the team, Hawkeye seemed the likely target. The film leans into that idea. I mean, it really leans into it. I believe Whedon deliberately employed cliched tropes, such as introducing Clint's family, to play on viewers' expectations. However, Pietro was ultimately the one to perish. He didn't see that coming. Not only did this subvert viewers' expectations, Pietro's heroic sacrifice tragically completed his journey from self-serving victim to selfless Avenger. In hindsight, you actually can see it coming. You get hurt, hurt him back. You get killed, walk it off. Despite only appearing in one film, Pietro's death still carries emotional weight, especially for Wanda. Yeah. 
The first trailer for Age of Ultron, set to a haunting rendition of I've Got No Strings from Disney's Pinocchio, promised a darker tone than the first film. While some were disappointed the film didn't go further, it is undeniably darker than its predecessor. The sequel also looks more cinematic and features more international locations, making the threat feel more global. The filmmakers deliberately included elements of fan service, such as the Hulk vs Hulkbuster fight. Veronica, the mobile service module which houses the Hulkbuster suit, was named after Veronica Lodge from Archie Comics, the romantic rival of Betty Cooper. Betty Ross was the name of Bruce's love interest in The Incredible Hulk. By 2015, the MCU had become a much bigger and more complicated place than it had been in 2012. The film packs a lot into its two and a half hour runtime, which does result in certain aspects such as Ultron's creation feeling somewhat rushed. Composer Brian Tyler replaced Alan Silvestri for the sequel. Tyler took the opportunity to reuse some of the themes he had written for both Iron Man 3 and Thor The Dark World. This helped create a sense of musical continuity which hadn't been common in previous MCU films. Ironically, one piece Tyler didn't bring back was Silvestri's Avengers theme. Instead, Danny Elfman, who also composed music for this film, created a new hybrid theme incorporating elements of Silvestri's music. Tyler and Elfman worked closely to ensure their music blended together seamlessly. The Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. episode The Dirty Half Dozen directly sets up the Avengers raid on Hydra in the opening scene. Time to bring in the Avengers. The following episode, Scars, provides some explanation for the convenient helicarrier which appears at the end of the film. Age of Ultron sets up a number of future films. Thor's vision was meant to foreshadow the events of Ragnarok which had already been announced as the title of the character's third solo film. However, in hindsight, these scenes do not match the tone of that film at all. The appearance and subsequent dismemberment of Ulysses Claw, played by Andy Serkis, sets up the character's appearance in Black Panther. Speaking of which, Age of Ultron includes the first mention of Wakanda, wa, 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 Wakanda. At the end of the film, Thor mentions that the Mind Stone is the fourth of the Infinity Stones to show up in the last few years. This count includes the Power Stone from Guardians of the Galaxy, implying Thor is aware of the events of that film, at least to some degree. Thanos makes another cameo in the film's mid credit scene, setting up his more significant role in Avengers Infinity War. Fine. I'll do it myself. With the formation of a new team at the end of the film, Avengers Age of Ultron feels like the end of an era. The sequel's ambition is admirable, though the film does require multiple viewings in order to fully appreciate it. Much like Iron Man 2, Age of Ultron occasionally focuses on setting up future elements at the expense of telling its own story. Ultimately, this is a highly entertaining film with some exciting hints of things to come. To end Phase 2, Marvel chose to embrace one of their sillier sounding characters, Ant-Man. Originally, Ant-Man was planned to be the first film of Phase 3, however it was instead moved to the end of Phase 2. This is a comparatively small scale film, which really works in its favour. The stakes are far more personal, and there is a strong focus on character relationships. As mentioned earlier, Michael Douglas plays the original Ant-Man, Dr. Hank Pym. Dr. Pym? Yes. I'm still alive. In light of Hank's work with S.H.I.E.L.D. in the 70s and 80s, Ant-Man actually predates most of the MCU superheroes, with the exception of Captain America. And Thor, technically. The film sees Hank recruit the new Ant-Man, Scott Lang, played by Paul Rudd. Scott, I need you to be the Ant-Man. In comics, it isn't uncommon for a new character to take on a pre-existing superhero mantle. However, that idea hadn't really been explored on the big screen before. The closest equivalent would probably be the ending of The Dark Knight Rises. The theme of passing the torch gives the film a generational feel, 
There is a strong focus on family. Ultimately, what wins Scott over is Hank appealing to him as a father. This is your chance. The chance to earn that look in your daughter's eyes. To become the hero that she already thinks you are. It's not about saving our world. It's about saving theirs. Throughout the film, Scott's motivations revolve around his young daughter Cassie. Abby Ryder Fortson, who played Cassie, was born two months before the release of Iron Man, making her the same age as the MCU itself. Her performance is incredibly sweet. Are you trying to find my daddy? Uh, yeah, I am, sweetheart. I just want your daddy to be safe. Hope you don't catch him. Rudd was perfectly cast. His natural charisma helps to make Scott a likeable character despite being a convicted criminal. The scene in which he breaks into Hank's safe demonstrates the character's intelligence and resourcefulness before ever putting on the suit. I poured water in the locking mechanism and froze it with nitrogen. Ice expands, metal doesn't. What are you doing now? Waiting. Waiting. Those same traits allow him to escape the quantum realm at the end of the film. Evangeline Lilly plays Hank's estranged daughter, Hope Van Dyne. With Scott's help, Hope is able to reconcile her rather complicated relationship with Hank, and finally get closure regarding her mother's death. I lost your mother. I didn't mean to lose you too. Lilly and Rudd have great chemistry. The relationship between Hope and Scott develops naturally over the course of the film. You know, the honest truth is I actually went from despising you to almost liking you. You, you really should write poetry. <laughs> the film's mid-credits scene sets Hope up to become the Wasp, the mantle previously held by her mother, Janet Van Dyne. The film's antagonist, Darren Cross, becomes increasingly unhinged as the film progresses. As Hank points out, He's not the most stable guy to begin with. Corey Stoll revels in his villainous performance without ever going too over the top. And I'm enjoying myself. Scott's friend Luis, played by Michael Pena, provides many of the film's funniest moments. Hey, how's your girl, man? Oh, she left me. Oh. Yeah, my mom died too. And my dad got deported. But I got the van. It's nice. Yeah, right? Ant-Man is essentially a light-hearted heist film. It doesn't take itself too seriously. However, it is emotionally sincere. Thank you, Paxton. I'm blown away. Thank you for everything you do for Cassie. Oh, well, that's my pleasure. But no, this one I, I did for you. A lot of humor is derived through the perception of size. Edgar Wright had been hired by Marvel Studios to co-write and direct an Ant-Man film back in 2006. Wright spent years developing the script, and in 2012, shot a brief sequence as a proof of concept. This test footage was screened during the Marvel Studios panel at San Diego Comic-Con that year. However, in 2014, Wright left the production due to creative differences. His departure left many fans, myself included, feeling disappointed. Though he was still credited as one of the film's writers, as well as an executive producer, we may never know how much of his work appeared in the finished film. With just over a year until the film's release, Peyton Reed was brought on to direct. Unlike certain other examples, the change of director doesn't show in the finished film. Much like the physics behind Captain America's shield, the science in this film is a little, shall we say, iffy. I use electromagnetic waves to stimulate their olfactory nerve center. I speak to them. A film about a character the size of an insect isn't exactly an original concept. However, Ant-Man really pushed the boundaries. The film's visual effects are fantastic. The filmmakers used a variety of techniques to realize the film's different sized environments as realistically as possible. Of course, the technical marvels aren't limited to the shrinking scenes. The digitally de-aged Michael Douglas seen in the opening scene is impressively convincing. The film's ants were deliberately designed to be more appealing than the real thing. As a result, it is genuinely sad when Antony gets shot. Antony! The VFX are even more impressive considering the post-production team lost 10 weeks from their schedule due to the change of director. 
As part of Ant-Man's viral marketing campaign, Marvel launched the web series WHIH Newsfront, with Leslie Bibb reprising her role as Christine Everhart from Iron Man and Iron Man 2. They also released this. Composer Christoph Beck's score gives the film a distinctive flavour. One of the biggest criticisms of Phase 2 was the lack of team-ups and crossovers following the Avengers. Ant-Man not only pokes fun at that criticism, it actually offers an explanation for its solo film status. I think our first move should be calling the Avengers. I spent half my life trying to keep this technology out of the hands of a Stark. I'm sure as hell not going to hand deliver it to one now. While Ant-Man is largely a standalone film, it still included several Easter eggs and references. Silly, I know. Propaganda. Tales to Astonish. Ant-Man first appeared in Marvel Comics' Tales to Astonish in 1962. The opening flashback revisits the Triskelion from Captain America the Winter Soldier and features another cameo by Hayley Atwell as Peggy Carter, alongside John Slattery reprising his role as the older Howard Stark. In addition to Hydra, those interested in Darren Cross's yellow jacket suit include the Ten Rings. <laughs> One of my favourite scenes is the raid on the Avengers facility. Hank, didn't you say this was some old warehouse? It's not! You son of a bitch! Anthony Mackie's cameo as Falcon was not only an unexpected highlight, but also set up Scott's future involvement in the wider MCU. It's really important to me that Cap never finds out about this. Despite its silly premise, Ant-Man is another welcome addition to the ever-expanding MCU. As they did with Guardians of the Galaxy, Marvel once again demonstrated their commitment to fresh quality storytelling. Though Phase 2 included the same number of films as Phase 1, it is currently the shortest phase in terms of release dates. Ant-Man's post credit scene gave viewers their first glimpse at Phase 3, with a scene from the upcoming crossover, Captain America Civil War. I will be reviewing Captain America Civil War, Doctor Strange and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 in a future Franchise Reviews video, so make sure you're subscribed. In the meantime, as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this franchise in the comments. Let me know which of these three films is your favourite and why. If you enjoyed this video, why not give it a like? Maybe share it with a friend or an enemy. Either way, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to see more content here on Channel 73.